A harbor gig came alongside soon after our arrival, the Admiral and Sir George Bingham. The Colonel commanding the 55th Line Infantry Regiment went ashore to look for a dwelling that would be suitable for the Emperor and his retinue while waiting for a proper residence to be found. A few hours later, the Admiral came back on board with Colonel Wilkes, Governor of St. Helena for the East India Company, and introduced him to the Emperor. Colonel Wilkes answered promptly and respectfully the many questions the Emperor asked of him and did so like a man of heart and intelligence. The India Company was turning this island over to the British government for the duration of the Emperor's captivity. The brig Ferre and the frigate Havana, separated from us by the storm in Madeira, had been at anchor in St. Helena for the past 17 days. The Brazilian route taken by these two ships was far preferable to that taken by the Admiral. After such a long crossing, it would have been agreeable to disembark as soon as we arrived. But we understood that it was necessary to find a house large enough to suitably accommodate so many people. Everyone was awaiting the return of the Admiral, who would decide on the time of debarkation. It was not to be. And the whole days of the 15th and 16th were spent before setting foot on this damned island, as Countess Bertrand called it. The Admiral and Colonel Bingham again went ashore, and in the evening on their return, they announced to the Emperor that they had found a small house in town for him and his retinue to live in while awaiting the completion of Longwood. Although the instructions from the ministry stated the Emperor was to remain on board until such time as he could be housed in a manner assuring his detention, the Admiral, more humane than the ministers, took it on himself to have him come ashore. On the evening of the 17th, prior to leaving the Northumberland, the Emperor summoned Captain Ross to take his leave of him and asked him to express his gratefulness to the officers and the crew. His goodbyes were received with great interest by those who heard them and deeply touched those to whom they were repeated. The Emperor got into the gig, accompanied by the Admiral and Count Bertrand, and was quartered in a small house belonging to Monsieur Portillos. It was extremely clean. It was, however, not practical because of its smallness and its position and did not allow the Emperor to move about inside without being seen by passerby, nor to go out without finding himself suddenly in contact with the inhabitants of a few nearby houses making up what was called the town. The Admiral, accompanying the Emperor to the drawing room, told him that this installation was temporary and that he was going to speed up work at the lodgings designated by his government. He again repeated that though it was up to him that he be as comfortable as possible, he was short of resources to finish the work as promptly as he wished. I had gone ashore before the emperor and had already looked over the place. The drawing room was on the ground floor, the bedroom on the second floor. This house had neither garden nor courtyard. I saw sorrowfully that my dream during the entire voyage was not going to be realized. Complete isolation in a practical house with shade and water for the emperor. I would have liked for him the Madonna of Marciana from the island of Elba with its cool, dense shade and its charming stream. Instead, we had a sun beating down on us, burning our skulls in the city. By 8 p.m., everyone had left the Northumberland and had gathered in this house where no one found himself much more comfortable than on board ship. I had arranged the emperor's room according to his customary habits as much as possible. But the little room which was destined for my use had no exit except into that room, making it quite impractical for me. The emperor slept poorly. He asked me for his covered lamp, slipped on his robe, and took a book. He spoke to me of the impracticability of this house and his desire that Longwood, located near a forest on an elevated plateau, be ready soon so he could move in there. I shall go tomorrow with the Admiral to look at this house, and it will have to be in very adequate shape indeed for me not to find a way to lodge there. These words gave me immense pleasure as my soul had filled with such great sadness when we entered the door to the city that I had bid an eternal farewell to my family. In the evening, I learned that the Admiral had opposed the landing of General Gorgo's servant. He was not included in the official government list 
and no matter how much the general insisted on keeping his servant to whom he was attached, the admiral was inflexible. He was put on board the brig sent to Europe to announce the arrival of the emperor in St. Helena. The next morning, at 8 o'clock, the emperor, the admiral, and the grand marshal, followed by Saint-Denis, mounted horses to go examine the house the emperor had talked to me about during the night. I learned in his absence from the present house's owner that the temperature on the plateau was quite inconsistent. There were constant changes from fair to bad weather, and the milder climate of the town would be far preferable if they were willing to give the emperor the government house. The apartments were spacious there. A fine terrace overlooked the water's edge. However, the emperor could not enjoy the freedom, which would be given to him in any other part of the island for fear of his escape. I was little attracted by the advantages of the emperor staying in the city. In my point of view, the condition which destroyed them all was the restriction of his freedom. On his way to Longwood, the emperor saw a small house located in a place that seemed to him rustic and charming. He was told it belonged to a Mr. Balcombe. He continued on his way, but intended to stop there in his return. If Longwood was not habitable, he indeed preferred its smallest shack to a house in town where he was not able to move about with being seen by passerby. The emperor arrived at Longwood and was not particularly enchanted with the house that enjoyed no shade or water and was exposed to the southeast wind that prevailed there constantly and was quite strong at the present time. He immediately realized all the work remaining to be done for him to take up residence there and paid little attention to everything the admiral would say regarding construction projects and improvements. The only advantage he saw there for himself was that it was a plateau extending several miles that would allow him to ride and even go out in his carriage if they were willing to cut paths through the woods of gum trees that stood a short distance from the house. The lieutenant governor, Colonel Skelton, who had resided at Longwood, had been extremely pleasant when he greeted the emperor, but he could not prevent the disagreeable impression it made. They had taken great care not to show the emperor the other part of the island where the governor's residence, plantation house, lay, and in which they could very well have placed him. Plantation House was then the same house that I saw 25 years later when I had the honor of retrieving the emperor's mortal remains under the leadership of the Prince of Joinville. It was pleasantly situated, sheltered from the easterly winds, surrounded by water and cool shade, dominating a well-cultivated valley with magnificent trees and well-marked paths. On seeing the elegance of the interior arrangements of this residence, I could not prevent my memory from returning to the barbaric process that had presided over the choice of Longwood as the emperor's residence. When there was such a charming one on the opposite side of the island, there his life could have lasted longer. Yet they wanted the severity of the climate to extinguish it as quickly as possible. Eternal shame upon the British government. Here is some information regarding our discovery of St. Helena that will be of some interest to the reader. Now that this island henceforth famous, had become the state prison for the emperor as well as his grave. Jamestown, located on the Chapel Bay, is surrounded by denuded rocks rising more than 600 feet above sea level. The island is guarded against anything unexpected, not only because of the lookouts who can spot any approaching ships as far as 15 leagues out to sea, but also because of the formidable defenses that could prevent any access. From the bay, the town is hidden by a wall that follows the contour of the bay up to the government palace. Between that barrier and the sea stretches a pier where six artillery corps are located at water level, providing crossfire and defending the entrance to the harbor. No vessel can enter without passing under their barrage. Gunnery units, no less considerable, are established at various levels along the almost sheer cliffs that dominate the town. On each of these platforms are forts covering Jamestown, the bay, and the harbor, transforming that area into a veritable fortress, impossible to approach. From the pier, the town is entered by a covered road cut through the boundary and leading to a narrow door closed off by a drawbridge. Beyond is a large level square planted with trees on the right and left. 
The government house is luxurious within and is bordered on the left by the East India Company's gardens of abundant trees and exotic plants, while the church is on the right. Private houses and stores, painted and clean, surrounded this square and constitute the street that extends in the direction of the valley and the road to Longwood. The whole of this little town, made up of about 100 houses, is clean and elegant. When following the valley that rises to Balcombe Cottage, one finds the East India Company stores in airy garrison and country cottages. On account of the stream fed by a waterfall coming from the mountains, enclosing the southern valley, the vegetation is lush, and whether ascending the Longwood Road or that of Plantation House, the scene is quite picturesque. The stream provides ships with a watering spot, allowing them to take water on board at the shore without entering town. When we arrived, there were no island roads suitable for carriages. All connections were by country lanes, and the island counted on about 500 white residents, including the garrison and about 300 slaves. In 1821, there were about 800 whites, 300 Negroes, and as many Chinese or Indians, some of whom were employed at Longwood as servants in the kitchen, pantry, and wardrobe. At the beginning of our stay, water was brought by barrels, so the emperor could not take baths as he would have wished. It was only much later that Sir Hudson Lowe, having undertaken the construction of a very large cistern at the foot of Diana's Peak, made it possible to gather water there during the rainy season. Longwood and the camp were then sufficiently supplied. The island resources were so small when we arrived there that the garrison for close to one year had drawn rations as they did on board ship. The inhabitants took from the company's stores the articles they might need and were allowed to kill neither cattle nor sheep without governor's permission. The period when the inhabitants obtained luxuries in exchange for the fresh items they offered travelers is that when the vessels from the East India Company on their way from India to Europe arrive in St. Helena. This period lasts a few weeks and lends Jamestown a holiday spirit. After a long crossing, the foreigners are pleasantly surprised to find a retreat which offers them water, fresh meat, green vegetables, and fruit, and allows them to take long rides on horseback throughout the island, where there are pleasant residences such as Plantation House, Rosemary Hall, and Sandy Bay. The cottages of the Briars, Dutton, and Mason present them with fine hospitality and cool shade to rest from the hot sun. These advantages were non-existent at Longwood. This land possessed no more than a plateau on which a few unsuccessful attempts had been made to establish grain plantations. That part of the island was constantly beaten by southeasterly winds, as good as it might appear to travelers who have just completed a long crossing the climate of saint helena is generally unhealthy particularly in the area occupied by the emperor therefore nothing that the admiral was projecting in the way of improvements on the longwood plateau could appear attractive to the emperor it was simply a matter of making additions to a dilapidated single-story house of stone that had served as a residence for the lieutenant governor while approaching town on his return from Longwood, the emperor expressed to the admiral his wish to see the Briars. He promptly took him there. On their way, the emperor told him that if the owner of the house did not object to it, he would like to occupy the pavilion that was about 25 paces from the main building. He preferred living there to his accommodations in town. When they arrived at the cottage, the request was made to the owner, who granted it wholeheartedly, although taken to his bed with gout, he expressed his desire to relinquish his house. The emperor conveyed his appreciation but did not wish to accept. He told him that he would occupy the pavilion separated from the main house with pleasure on condition that the family's habits would not be disrupted. After pointing out to the emperor the cramped nature of this lodging in which he would be waiting for the work at Longwood to be completed, the admiral promptly acquiesced to his desire and the grand marshal returned to town alone. He advised me of the emperor's decision to settle temporarily at the Briars and ordered me to have his things brought there and to have Navaraz accompany me. At the same time, he gave instructions to Cipriani, the butler, to have dinner brought from town every day during his stay. The emperor also invited Count de la Casas, who thought he should come without his son, 
But the emperor, noticing this, said to him, I do not wish to separate those who are so close. Go send for young Emmanuel. I had a moment of joy when I learned this decision. After arranging everything and putting Novaraz in charge of bringing the baggage, I went to join the emperor. No matter how gratifying the sensation was that I experienced upon entering Jamestown, the sight of these pretty little houses so attractively painted, which pleasantly decorated the only street and public square, no matter how beautiful, well-landscaped, and shady the botanical garden were, I abandoned it all without regret for isolation because I imagined in town nothing more than a somber residence, annoying and impracticable in view of the emperor's habits. Finally, the family life for which I yearned, in which there would be no longer any Englishman, had much to be said for it. The road I followed to go to the Briars was that which led to Longwood. Cut into the side of the mountain, it oversees the town and the little valley which from there continues to the foot of the sheer cliff where it ends. There, a silver stream falls from the top of this black rock and arrives at the base in a light mist, giving birth to a stream covered with watercress that meanders down to the town. The emperor's pavilion looked out over the small valley, where here and there were strewn a few small houses surrounded by seemingly well-kept gardens. The town and the ships in harbor with the whole ocean as a horizon, presented a picturesque view, not devoid of charm. The aridity of the rocks that dominated the town and extended out to the briars gave even more value to the vegetation covering this small, narrow piece of ground. I found the emperor sitting at the door to his pavilion, chatting with the admiral, who had remained with him. He called me over and asked if the baggage was being attended to. I replied that it would be there within an hour. Nothing could be more cramped than this small pavilion, which I immediately explored. A small anteroom, a large room with four windows and above two small rooms under the roof that were reached by a small staircase from the antechamber. Such was the entire lodging that would be occupied by the emperor, Count Lacasas, his son, Saint-Denis, Novaraz, and myself. The outbuildings of the main house were meager, but a fresh lawn spread in front. The garden was well kept. Water and shade were not lacking, and the emperor's solitude was never disturbed there. The lady of the house and her two charming daughters offered everything that could be of assistance in furnishing the room reserved for the emperor. I accepted a few chairs, an armchair, and a table. What arrived from the city with Novaras would allow the emperor to settle into his usual habits. At the Briars, one had to consider oneself camping. The emperor found around him the furnishings of a field tent.